last lecture. I know a few of you read Randy Posh's last lecture on your way into Paraclete, so I figured one for me would be appropriate on your way out. As often as I've shared my life with you, there's a lot I haven't told you. Some of that gets shared in this lecture. Please know that these stories are mine. I get the right to decide who knows them or not. But through these life experiences, I've learned a lot. And these are the life lessons I want you to know before you leave me. So without further ado, 21 things I learned in college and early adulthood I wish I knew in high school. Number one, priorities matter. When I was six or seven, my best friend's dad was my CCD teacher for my first communion classes. And though that sounds more or less inconsequential to a 30-something, Mr. Henry taught me something I'll never forget. I want to repeat that lesson right now. Can't do it entirely, but he had a jar, and I think a rice, and three walnuts. So the jar was representative of our life. Walnuts represented God's library, work, extracurriculars, whatever. Where you put your heart and subsequently your effort is where you earn your treasure. When your priorities get mixed up, things get effed up and often quickly. I'll talk about that a little more later. Keep your priorities straight. Number two, you can accomplish a lot with good time management. And this one is almost like a bullet point within the last slide, but it's important enough a lesson to stand on its own. You hear it all the time. Don't procrastinate. And before you tell me that you work best under pressure or that you're the best at procrastination, stop. First off, I'm the best at procrastination. I bet you couldn't write a 102 page <laughs> master's thesis in a week, including your research, but this is not about being a good procrastinator. It's about using your time well. Because time management can allow you to get a lot done in the same 24 hours everyone else has. Allocate your time to those things that matter, and you'll accomplish everything else, too. Thanks for that. Number three, you are not everyone else. No, you're not. no this is not another you're so unique thing. You are, but that isn't about this story. What I mean is, don't compare yourself to everyone else, whether that be people on Instagram or in real life. Don't be afraid to look stupid trying to be the best you that you can be. And don't do stupid things just to fit in with everyone else. Because if people love that person or that version of you, they aren't really loving the real you anyway. Trust me, been there, done it. Again, more on that later. God has a specific plan for your life and you don't need to worry about fitting into someone else's timeline or their ideal image of a man or woman to find work. This is a lesson I always need reminding of. Obviously, my personal life has not ended up as I expected. I think a lot of us look to our parents and the way they lived their lives when they got married, had kids, etc., and decide that's how it's supposed to be, or at least I did. So growing up, I always expected I'd get married between 22 and 24. And when all of my friends did, it was hard not to feel like I was getting left behind. One of my best friends from college jokes that I'm the token single friend and jokingly wonders what the group dynamics would be like if I ever do get married. <laughs> to my friends and their kids, I'm just weird, and weird plus someone else would be different. I still struggle with feelings of inadequacy or feeling like a failure because my timeline isn't what I thought it would be or what everyone else has turned out to be. But then I remember my next lesson. God's got you. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. This one's hard because I know it doesn't always feel like it, but it's true. Even in your struggles and pains and sufferings, God makes everything work together for your good. Everything you experience is meant to teach you something. Something about God or yourself or an other. If he brings you to it, he'll bring you through. And I know that sounds so extraordinarily cliche, but in my life experience thus far, I know nothing truer. So with that in mind, don't sweat the small stuff. A few years ago, I had a student whose life motto was, nothing matters. They even had it embroidered on their letterman's jacket. The thing is, most of the time, I don't think they meant it in a depressing or nihilistic way. When we talked about it, I learned nothing matters was meant to be more of a say la vie or it is what it is kind of thing. I learned firsthand how important that attitude can be. Nothing is so important that you sacrifice who you are or that you sacrifice your long-term well-being. I wish I had taken that to heart before I had a heart attack at 26 from stress. In my recovery, I learned an important lesson I want to share with you. Relax a little. 
Learn what you like doing to relax. As long as it's safe, legal, and not stupid, go for it. Read, learn a new hobby, exercise, cook, play games, meet people, get involved, help others, pray, meditate, go to adoration, sing, learn an instrument. Whatever that thing is that brings you a sense of true divine inner peace, do that. Don't think you can't find the time to find mental and emotional health. And that being said, it's more than okay to ask for help. This might mean therapy. It might mean tutoring. It might mean asking for prayers. It might mean asking for direction, or maybe even just asking for directions. Hell, it might just mean finding someone, anyone to listen to you. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. On the contrary, it's actually a sign of strength and humility. It means knowing you don't know it all and hoping to learn something new. And that's another thing. Never stop learning. It ain't cute to be dumb. School matters. It's not a joke. Like, go to your classes. Not go in can seriously bite you in the ass eventually. At least, it did for me. Y'all know I went to the University of Arizona, and most of you know I went on a full-ride scholarship through the Honors College. Well, with great power comes great responsibility. In this case, graduating with honors meant keeping my GPA above a 3.5, taking at least 18 units of honors classes, and writing an honors thesis, a minimum of 20 pages. Taking 18 honors units, check. Writing honors thesis, check. Although I procrastinated on that one too. Not proud. 3.5 GPA, not so much. Fall semester of my junior year was atrocious. I'm not sure if I have the words to explain how awful absolutely everything felt. My life and my priorities were changing, though mostly positively, and that added some stress. My home life fell apart and quickly, not my family life, my home life. One of my best friends and teammates from high school died in a tragic traffic accident. Those of you who play sports know what I mean when I say it felt like I'd lost a sibling. I was in a toxic dating relationship, and I had the worst classroom placement in the history of U of A College of Education classroom placements. I was assigned to a middle school. Bad enough, but it wasn't just any middle school. Oh no, I was assigned to a charter middle school for kids who had been expelled from traditional public schools. I hated every minute I had to spend there. It was so bad I almost changed my major halfway through my junior year. So classes were my least priority. And the ones I, were taking, I was taking were awful anyway. Modern English grammar? When my life is falling apart? No thanks. So I stopped going to class much. I barely got work done, but managed to escape that semester with my scholarship intact, but the damage was already done. Cut to Good Friday of my senior year. I was in the last two months of college, and I went to visit my honors advisor to get my sign off to, for graduating with honors. And then she told me, you have a 3.42, and only six of your 18 units a semester count toward your GPA. Student teaching doesn't count. So it's not mathematically possible for you to get a 3.5. Sorry. I left that meeting ashamed and quite honestly pissed. Not so much at anything or anyone, but at myself. Because I knew that I had done that to myself. There I was writing this 20 page paper for what? And it hit me. Had I just gone to class more that awful semester, I wouldn't be in the pew listening to the last seven words of Jesus crying about my failings and wondering how God could have abandoned me like that. But I knew it wasn't God abandoning me. It was me abandoning me. I knew school was a walnut, but I'd let it become rice. Lesson learned. So real talk, take college seriously. You're not just there to party. But also remember that life is the best classroom. You can learn something new every day. In fact, I once told you about a Jeopardy champion whose dad taught her to learn three new things every day. That's great advice. Never get complacent in what you know or how good you are at something, nor should you ever be so overly confident that you don't see room to improve. Be a lifelong learner of all the things. That's part of what teaches you wisdom. Number eight, don't be so selfish. I know I just told you it's okay to take time for self-care. In fact, one of the things my cardiologist told me to do during my recovery was to learn to say no. Y'all should learn to say no too. Sometimes. But at the same time, please remember something I taught you last year. Your life is not just yours. Help people, listen to them, volunteer, 
Take a stand for what is genuinely good and right. Take yourself out of the center of your universe for five seconds and look around. You'll see how much the world needs you and what you have to offer. In my time in Tucson, I learned a lot about the value of what Deacon Greg calls the ministry of presence. You'd be shocked at how many amazing conversations I had with the homeless in Tucson, both in the soup kitchen at Casa Maria Catholic Worker House, ooh, ooh, shout out to Dorothy Day, and on the buses. Probably the most impactful of those conversations came with a middle-aged homeless guy who needed the last 10 cents for his bus fare. I was at the bus depot downtown, switching buses on my way home from student teaching, and getting on the bus he was going on, so I offered him the nap. He thanked me profusely, and we boarded, quickly finding seats next to each other, because the afternoon number four bus was always so crowded. He offered me his last slice of pizza as a thanks. I politely declined, but then he offered me something so much better, his story. He asked me why I was so dressed up, and I told him about student teaching. He told me he was proud of me and that it was good that I had goals. Don't lose sight of those goals, he told me. He went on to say how he'd been a scholarship football player at USC, but had lost sight of his own goals. He talked about how he got into drugs and alcohol, got involved with all the wrong people, lost his scholarship, and then got kicked out of the school. Disgraced and without options, he took what money he had, boarded a Greyhound, and went as far as he could afford to. He ended up in Tucson and had stayed in his dire situation for years. He told me to remember my goals, my family, and God, and that if I kept my priorities straight, he was sure I'd make something of myself. As I got off the bus at my stop, I thanked him for his words, walked down the bus stairs, and started my walk to my apartment, but I couldn't stop crying. Because of all the volunteering I'd done in the last couple of years, these 10 minutes I spent actually listening to someone who just needed to be heard, blessed me more profoundly than almost any other experience I'd had in Tucson. You'll be surprised how compassion, suffering with others, can bless you too. Number nine, being a person of faith isn't bad. In fact, keep growing your faith. I learned this one by not going to church, and I'm telling you now so that you don't have to separate yourselves from God to learn the same lesson. Be who you are. I tried so hard to be someone different when I left for college and experienced freedom for the first time. Like, so hard. Part of that for me was leaving the idea of organized religion behind. I had a group of friends my freshman year. Two Christians, one's dad was a pastor, two other Catholics, though only one was practicing, and two agnostics. Together, we decided we didn't need church to feel God. We would learn about the divine through, through experience and through each other. So I stopped going to Mass. At first, it felt weird. I would hear the bells toll at 5 p.m. on Sundays and feel guilty because I knew where I should have been. I boldface lied to my parents about going to Mass, though it turns out they had caught on pretty quickly. And then it became easy to forego my faith. But in that year and a half I wasn't going to church, I genuinely felt an emptiness, a void. And like St. Augustine, I tried to fill that void with all the things the world can offer material goods, alcohol, friends, boys, experiences. But things just kept getting worse. The comparison game kicked in. I was perpetually envious of my then best friend. It was the first time I realized there was something really wrong with me. I would later learn that that was depression, but back then I just felt stuck. I hated myself even though my life was good, and I wondered how it might feel to just be done with life, literally. Thankfully, I never attempted, but trust me when I tell you I was planning. And then a Sunday evening in April 2009, my sister Allie had just gotten home from her year two confirmation retreat with St. Mary's. She called and told me they watched this great skit the core team performed, and that the skit was filmed and uploaded to YouTube. You need to watch it, she said. She kept calling to ask if I watched it yet, and after the third call in an hour, I was pissed and screamed, all right, fine, I'll watch the damn video. Thank God she nagged me forced me to watch that skit. In doing so, I realized that that void I'd been feeling, that longing I had was for God and only God. Again, how very Augustinian of me. I watched my god sister perform what had become of my life, and I sobbed. I mean, I ugly cried. It was like watching my own journey and realizing what was happening was a slap in the face. I needed God back. I made a YouTube playlist of Christian music that I didn't think sounded too hokey. And then I went to Mass every day that first week. And the week after that was Holy Week. 
I was living out my own resurrection and celebrating Jesus. I went to confession for the first time in at least three years and had a lot to get off my chest. That homecoming, as it were, was everything my soul needed. I know that many of you feel like you were forced into your faith growing up. I felt that way too. But having a faith life is nothing to be ashamed of. It's also okay to have questions and to have doubts. What's not okay is letting those questions and doubts take you away from the love of God. Go find some answers. Ask your questions. Find the parish where you feel home. You'll make the best friends there. And they're the ones who will encourage you to grow into the best version of yourself, the you God wants and needs you to be. Be proud of the fact that God has called you each by name and he's known you and had a plan for you since before you were even born. Like, celebrate the Jesus out there. Don't let society bully you out of love with Christ. And if you're where I was back then, and even if you're not, watch this video with me. Just don't watch me cry about it, because I will. <clears throat> Number 10, surround yourself with good people. And I mean genuinely good people, like positive influences, people that push you to be your best. If you have friends that pull you away from the good or encourage you to stagnate or settle, let them go. If you have friends that make you feel less about yourself, let them go. Find the friends that will stick with you through the losses and struggles of life. The ones who will uplift you or pray with you or pray for you. Be with the people who bring out the best in you. I've been so blessed by my friends. Most of my best friends I met at the Newman Center in college. They helped me find Jesus again and find myself again. They helped me, or they held me up when my family suffered six deaths in 13 months. They sent flowers when I had my heart attack. They sent care packages or flew me to see them after the breakup that wrecked me. They wished me happy holidays, sent pictures of their kids, most of whom called me Theo Huerta and love me like family. My other two best friends are former students and they're my support system outside my family here in the AV. They defend me in all things. They've been my rocks through the craziness of the pandemic, the breakup, dating in my 30s, and more family tragedy. I know I'd be lost without them helping me to remember who I am and what I believe in. Find yourselves some good people. Number 11, you can party a little, but don't be dumb. Be safe. I like you people. Please don't do anything that puts at risk my chance to ever see you again. There's a reason I tell you at the end of every week or every day to be safe and make good choices. I've lost and almost lost students to bad decisions. A beer run gone bad, a drunk night in the desert, severe concussions. Know your risk factors. One of the last things my parents reminded me of before they left me in my dorm was, be smart, you know your family history. And I did. My grandfather died of alcoholism at 50. Two of my aunts consider themselves recovering alcoholics. And the other side of my family is wrought with addiction. This should have given me more pause when I was young. It does now. Think through all of your decisions. If you doubt it, don't do it. Number 12, the internet is forever. Whether you delete it or not, close the account or not, or even if the platform goes defunct, if you ever had it on the internet or social media, it's still somewhere. And it can kill your ability to get into schools, get or keep scholarships, or get your dream job. So be smart. Don't post profanity. Don't post when you're really mad or really sad. Don't post pictures, videos, snaps, TikToks, whatever of you partying, especially if you're doing so underage. Don't post stuff that's too revealing. It's a tough world, but you can always vent in ways other than something that's potentially damning later in life. Number 13, don't live in odd numbers and maybe not with the best friend. Living in odd numbers is rough because someone inevitably gets left out. In a group of three or five, people tend to buddy up and someone ends up on the outside. And living with best friends can be a challenge too. Often you don't stay best friends. Y'all are growing and changing and becoming the adult versions of yourselves, and that's okay. Don't beat yourself up for drifting apart. If the relationship means that much to you, you'll always be able to find each other and support each other in the future. 
Instead, find someone you're kind of friends with and can grow to be best friends with. Of all my roommate situations, those are the only ones that ever worked out for me. Yeah, that living situation from junior year I mentioned before? I moved in with two of my best friends, and about a month in, they stopped talking to me entirely. I knew that going back to church would change things, but oof. I got letters from the house accountant, one of the girls' mom, left on the fridge to tell me to pay for groceries I hadn't eaten. I got passive-aggressive notes taped to my bedroom door. We had screaming matches through our doors. Everyone locked their bedroom when they left the house. I spent most of my time out of our house. The situation got so hostile that the roommate I shared a bathroom with started literally locking the toilet paper, including the active roll in her bedroom until I broke down and bought another pack for myself. It was petty. I don't even like remembering those days. They went on to live together a few more years and I was happily counting down the days until I moved in with a girl from Newman I'd hung out with a couple times, my now dear friend, Michelle. Even my mom said as we were moving me out of that house that the air felt heavy. That house was toxic. So again, no odd numbers, maybe not a best friend, and maybe buy your own toilet paper. Number 14, live within or below your means. Don't overspend, especially not to fit in. Don't put yourself in credit card debt either, because it's really, really hard to get out of it. Really pay attention to your account balances, even though it is basically the adult equivalent of checking your grades. Yay, college life. You can worriedly check both. Overdrafting on your debit accounts and things like that affect your credit, and maybe your parents too if they help you by co-signing onto your account. So learn how to budget. If that means instant ramen, pasta, microwave, burritos, and hot pockets for a few years, so be it. Just don't forget to exercise. <laughs> but yeah, number 15. So, so special. Underground will not make or break you. That's a perfect sign. Uh, where you go to undergrad doesn't define you. I'm no worse off for having chosen U of A than if I'd gone to Notre Dame after all. In fact, I'm probably better off because I finished undergrad on time and with no student debt. And I got to study what I really wanted to and not something similar enough just to say I went somewhere more prestigious. Your grades don't define you, except a little. Yeah, employers and graduate schools might ask for college transcripts, but that's okay. Your major doesn't define you either. Changing your mind is okay. Changing careers is okay. Going to a more prestigious university can be saved for post-grad work. Those of you who feel like you should be going somewhere better, don't stress it. Number 16, vocational schools are cool too. Not everyone is cut out for the traditional school system. If school is not your thing, go learn a trade and make bank. Being better at manual and technical work isn't something to hate about yourself. It's actually something you can cash in on. My little cousin Jake barely graduated high school. Like literally he had to argue his last English essay grade in order to graduate. But damn if he isn't a brilliant technical mind. He's been breaking things and putting them back together and building things and designing things his whole life. So when he finished high school, he started an 18 month welding program. He completed it in a year. He went on to help build the trailer that carried the Space Shuttle Endeavor back to the Science Center in LA. He made bank. And then he got bored. He's been in elevator mechanics for the last several years and now makes even more money. He's in something deeply specialized and it's paying off. He bought a house with property and a shop and a new truck in the last year. I'm so proud of him for embracing who he is and how he learns. He's amazing at what he does and talks about it with such pride. If this is you, go do it. Learn that trade, but be good at it. Work hard at it. You can do this. Number 17, don't settle. Don't settle for jobs or for people. Go after your dreams, for realsies. Do what you set out to do, even if people judge you for it. Trust me, I don't know how many times I got picked on for wanting to teach. I'm glad I did it anyway. Get what you deserve from others. Respect, true love. It's not worth getting into a relationship with someone just to be in a relationship. Wait for someone who meets or exceeds your expectations, even if, as I mentioned earlier, it's later in your life or in a different place than you intended. And I'm not judging, trust me, but I learned that waiting, you know what I mean, 
is actually more worth it than it seems. Eventually you'll meet someone to whom you wish you could hear something special, and you might feel a little sad if it's not quite that special anymore. I know you know what I mean, so I'll stick to double entendre here, thank you very much. But that duct tape comparison is real. I'm just saying. All that being said, never accept anyone treating you as anything less than a perfectly imperfect child of God. But stay humble. You are not now, nor will you ever be, too good for something. Whether that be a job you take to get by, or a place you have to live, or whatever, don't think it's beneath you. The same is true of people. Remember that no person on the streets is any less of a person than you are. Anything can happen. And God is in everyone. I know I taught you that. I just hope it sticks. And by the way, it's okay to come home. It wasn't exactly the plan to come back here, not to the AB, and certainly not to Parity. I wasn't thrilled to do it, but family came first, and I was needed here. And apparently God thought so too. As much as I detested the idea of coming home, it hasn't been all bad. In fact, it's been pretty beautiful. I got to build a relationship with my baby sister. I just found out recently that she didn't remember living with me before I left for college, so that relationship means even more to me now. I got to build an adult relationship with my parents that I treasure. I got to go to graduate school, experience love, find my most authentic self, work with some amazing humans, and play a part, small as it may be, in your lives. And that is worth saying I got sucked back into the AV. It always will be. Keep hustling. Number 19, remember whose you are. For those of you that watch Grey's Anatomy, you re might remember the quote, I made you from scratch. I always loved that line. Your parents, and especially God, made you from scratch and have brought you to where you stand today. Remember that you represent them in everything that you do. Number 20, be grateful. Use your manners. Say please and thank you. Appreciate the person who holds the door open for you. Appreciate those people whose jobs make yours possible. Thank your parents and families for the sacrifices they made and continue to make for you. And thank God for every day that you get. As you all well know, not everyone gets to this point in life. So be truly thankful for what you have instead of focusing on what you don't. Live in the moment, but be grateful for that moment, whether it be good or not as good. And lastly, love, love, and always love. According to my wise sage, Mr. Jerry Leonard, this is the meaning of life. Y'all have heard me talk about Mr. Leonard. He was my religion teacher sophomore and senior year. He made me think maybe more than any of my other teachers did, and I had signed up. I had to think about who I was, what the world was like, how I fit into all of that, what I believed. And I didn't just have to think about it, I also had to write about it. What a gift that kind of self-reflection turned out to be. Jerry was one of my favorite teachers of all time, and when he passed away, I was eternally grateful for his impact on my life. All throughout senior year, he told us he knew the meaning of life, but he wouldn't tell us what it was. We had to go seek him out and ask him in the future if we really wanted to know. Every time I came home over break, I'd come to Paraclete and visit with him. We'd catch up on each other's lives, and he'd offer me the advice I'd come to trust above most others. And sometimes I'd ask him about the meaning of life. Not yet, he said more than once. That hurt to me big time, but I knew someday he'd tell me. When I started working here, Jerry had been sick for a while. He only taught one more semester before his doctors made him retire. But the next Christmas at our faculty party, I sat with him and his wife, my boyfriend at the time sitting beside me on my other side. I asked Jerry one more time, what's the meaning of life? And this time, he smiled at me and said, it's sitting right next to you. Bewildered, I smiled back and asked, it's love, isn't it? He said, yes, love, love, and always love but also doing whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> I laughed so hard that day, and that comment stuck with me, clearly. I even wrote it in his book of memories at his memorial service. I love that I finally learned the meaning of life and that I heard it at 25, because Jerry was right. The meaning of life is love. And if you remember that, then everything you do will be rooted in love. And honestly, what more can you ask for than to live a life of love?
I'm so very proud of each of you, and I'm so excited to watch you all grow up and become the best versions of yourselves. I'm excited to hear all of your accomplishments, and I'll always be a message away to be a shoulder to cry on, an encouraging word, or an advisor. To quote James Taylor, winter, spring, summer, or fall, all you have to do is call and I'll be there. Yes, I will. That's fine. Have a beautiful life. Be safe. Make good choices. I love you all. That's what I'm